Um, I hope you uh, enjoyed a healthy break. Uh, and now we enter the uh, final discussion. And that will be introduced by Nora. Is she online? Yeah, 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 I see you, I see you, excellent. Um, okay, Nora, the floor is yours. And um, the idea of the discussion is that uh, those problems will be uh, tackled, that in the conclusion by Marcel, we have a program how to go on and what to do next. So don't make it too philosophical. I would say, um, what's up? after the discussion and how do we pursue things uh, for the coming period. Uh, so Nora, please try. You cannot ask me how to do things now because I've already written down everything. So it's no chance. <laughs> I will do the following. I think I made notes and they're far too long. So I will share the screen. It's not a PowerPoint, but it's a document. I think that should be possible. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Um, so I have tried to structure what was discussed in the last two days. And uh, I will not go into all the details because then I would be talking for half an hour or so. So I will only do the fat uh, concepts. So I think um, a lot of our discussions were conceptually how to create new concepts or put new concepts into the discussion. One was the dehomogenization of the concepts of the global north and the global south. Um, partly a reminder and the reconceptualization of the word system theory, core, semi-periphery and periphery. Then the very important um, contribution of Guy Ling Sung about going deeper into the analysis of power relations and processes of creating hegemony in the South. I'm not going into the details. Um, another important element of this dehomogenization of the global south is looking at internal forms of resistance. And we had this good example from China, also an example from Brazil. And um, how do these forms of um, creating legitimization and creating hegemony relate to the north-south relationship between these different movements and practices of resistance or the lack thereof. Then we had um, the concept that we need to differentiate between global south relations to the dominant powers in the global north, which include complicity of hegemonic political actors in the south with those in the north, one example was Brazil, resistance of global South countries against uh, being exploited through the usage as sinks and exploitation of their resources, competition with hegemonic systems of the North. The example was China. Again, is there a new, is China a new colonialist power or is it um, a new um, equal society organizing common prosperity? Or is that talk about common prosperity, a strategy trying to manage the new crisis that came up by the pandemic, the difficulty of export, the lay flatism movement? Is China a gated form of capitalism, new liberalism in China? Second big um, conceptual discussions were those about varieties of capital accumulation, past and present, including their crisis. So one was the fourth industrial revolution of capitalism, cyberization of everyday life. How does that um, uh, impact on or create new forms of the IMO? And uh, then there was the argument there is also a resistance against that and that in times of crisis, 
we are thrown back to the real life, to the life supporting background. And we have to look when we create the solidary way of living at this kind of supporting background in real life. Then there was the argument by Bob that we have to talk about world market. He criticizes an analysis of varieties of capitalism within different nation states and uh, argued that instead we have to see world markets as emergent results of different kinds of capital accumulation and um, the post-Fordist forms of capital accumulation he mentioned were knowledge-based economy. Um, and to that one has to um, add, I think, the dire need for knowledge and technology transfer to global South countries and regions in order to halt the unequal, not only exchange, but the unequal forms of dealing with the planetary crisis that we are facing. Um, then the finance-dominated accumulation of capital, the importance of spatial temporary fixes and their crisis, and the strategies, the new strategies to integrate workers into the new forms of capital accumulation uh, were, for example, employability as opposed to employment, creating the subjectivity of individual entrepreneurship, the self-employed worker with its new dependencies. Then what kind of theory shall we use? How to analyze the new forms of capital accumulation from regulation theory to governance? I was with the world market and theories. Ah, and then the concept, uh, another concept to understand forms of capital accumulation is the concept of social reproduction and sufficiency. The crisis of care and the transnational care chains and what happens when they break. I must say, sorry, I had technical difficulties to understanding what Krista was saying. Therefore, this is far too short. I just only had pieces of words and sentences that I could hear. I'm very sorry about that. Um, another form of looking at the present form of capital was the idea of crisis and interregnum. <laughs> and the impossibility of neoliberalism to create new forms of stable social compromise, the counter movements that exist there, stronger right, weaker left movements, and the strategy in order to deal with this crisis. One of the important ones is green capitalism through author or authoritarian stabilization and the effect this has on the North-South relations. Then the question of change, what was discussed in different ways through revolutionary resistance, the social actors there are the different forms of work and different categories of workers, relatively safe workers, precarious workers, and the different ways in which they are included in exploitative relations across the North and South and within the North and South. The social reproduction of workers care workers, badly paid and unpaid, and the crisis that showed how important these care workers were. The patriarchal, patriarchal, I don't think I pronounced that correctly, relations of power as a central element in all forms of capital accumulation. So uh, there was a lot of discussion about the informal workers and their marginalization. They are marginalized, but that doesn't mean that they are numerically few in many countries of the global south. For instance, in India, there are the majority of workers. In India, it's 90%. We had a short discussion about slavery and whether it will come back. And I just want to draw your attention to the fact that there are more slaves today than any time in history. 40 million workers in the world are working as slaves right now. We have to take that into consideration. Then there is a tendency, or the question is, is there a tendency towards the end of cheap labor since everywhere where production rises, demand for wages rises and capital has to go to another place in order to encounter cheap labor. The digital workers in higher and lower positions and the academics. So the question was, how can we, not we, but how can these workers and this different kind of workers 
within the global north and global south connect to each other, the new political movements, the feminization of those movements, the green movements, the eco-socialist movements, can they connect, how can they connect, and the degrowth movements. So I already said that, and uh, Uli said, yeah, I insist on that, all the problem of cooperation and relationships. I'm not going to repeat that now. The question was, is it, or the assumption was that changing our own living conditions in the global north as a form of solidarity towards, is, is a form of solidarity towards countries and regions in the global south. The problem is, will that result in higher wages for precarious workers or simply making them unemployed? You know, it's this whole question about uh, we're not going to buy things that ha have been produced by workers in precarious situation, child work and so on. Is that a good thing? Because then their wages will be raised or is that a bad thing? Because then they will lose employment altogether is a question, I think, that also needs more research. Then the question of change through reactionary resistance. We have discussed that a little bit, but not enough. We would have to know what kind of social actors are there exactly, what categories of workers, classes, gender. A lot of research needed there. Then we discussed the question of changing politics and disruptions as, um, as a source for change or a possibility for change or a necessity for change. Um, the probable arrival of new left, center left parties in some countries, example, Brazil. How to break the consensus of liberal democracy and markets. Is China really an example that, that for that? Fourth, understanding the economic political processes and the forms of everyday lives through the ways in which they are integrated in the transformation of nature and transformed by nature is still in need of being further developed, I think. There was a little bit about that, but that was not central to our discussion. But Uli already discussed that, so I'm not going into the details here. But it is important to stress that there is still, um, maybe still is too optimistic to say, factions in the left that buy into the concept of nature as endlessly exploitable, thus disregarding and forgetting Marx's analysis of capitalism as a mode of production that destroys the basis of life and work, the worker and the earth, and his insistence that it is not labor alone that produces value and wealth, but only labor and nature together. So I think that is perhaps a discussion that we still need to have in different parts of the left in the world, although it has been discussed for a long time now. Um, so in my view, theories of understanding different regimes of capital accumulation still think of the relationship to nature as an add-on, not as included as a facilitator and a product of those forms of capital accumulation. Then fifth, and the last point, the alternatives, how to think and work for alternatives, was what is a good life, how to define it, how has it been defined historically? We need some research on the history of different concepts of the good life and the demands for a good life. The logic of care as constitutive basis for a green and solidarity economy, democracy, justice, use value, and public value. Are there models to which the left can refer? For instance, William Morris was mentioned. Then the new green economy as opposed to green capitalism. However, does this even progressive new economy relate to the global embeddedness of all economies and of all workers of all kinds? So, is, for instance, the good life uh, more free time as a means to develop global solidarity and take part in developing democracy and thereby developing oneself? The role of the state, what kind of new forms of state do we need? Can we imagine a planning state, planning for transformative change? Um, how and who will pressure for such a kind of state? Can we learn from China there with all reservations? 
What is the relation between the need for an interventionist state and the broadening of democracy? Um, new insights into the relevance of systemic workers. We already have that. The question of growth and degrowth. There was a short discussion that degrowth does not mean having fewer resources, but it means ending the regime of capitalist growth enforcement. I have some reservations about that because I think we have uh, the, necess the necessity to reduce the resources that we're using. For instance, one of the problems that I see when um, the Green Party or Green Movement, some Green Movements, most Green Movements perhaps, discuss uh, the shift to renewable energy as the solution for everything, they don't take into account that renewable energy is actually not the sun and the wind, but the machine to create that kind of in that, uh, energy. And for the construction of those machines, we need many minerals. And um, there are not sufficient minerals in the world even just to shift the energy we are using at the moment to renewable energy. It's not possible. And it becomes even more impossible if we think about creating more energy need, like for instance, for electric cars and so on. So I think there is a big problem here in imagining an, um, a green transition, even within the left, even within green movements. Finally, the creation of scenarios for an alternative future, making them visible is important, but I think making them visible also has to include making the contradictions, the dialectics, visible because otherwise we cannot develop the alternatives because we don't know where the points of intervention are. I think that was all that I could gather from our discussion. Okay, thanks. Brilliant, thank you very much. Um, well, of course you bring in, or as the, where's my screen going? Spotlight if you refer, okay. No. There's something on my screen. I don't know what I mean. Zoom seven. Yeah. Okay. yeah, I am again. Um, Roger. Um, yeah, okay, you bring up a, a tedious problem of technology, which we didn't discuss this, um, this meeting about the resources, the mineral resource, and the type of energy and energy conversion. Of course, it is uh, not only a sociological problem, political problem, but also a uh, problem of the directions uh, of research and technology in a different society. I mean, that is uh, worth uh, a new conference. Uh, well, the first who wants to react on this is uh, Turkle. No, your hand is waving. Uh, your hand is okay, waving. Well, it's not waving anymore. Uh, you're, you're fine. Um, who wants the floor to in this last section, um, or did Nora said everything? Uli, yeah. Uli, you have your yes. hand, so uh, thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, just two uh, points. Thank you, Nora. This is, uh, yeah, we discussed two days a new research program, and you condensed it like a very, very, um, 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 in a very impressive way. I have just two thoughts. There's so many now to be discussed, but what I learned from uh, Michael's um, uh, research on the history of the US is, and I would like to now to juxtapose it. I think it's no, not a juxtaposition, but that we, that, that we can understand better. You say rightly, Nora, and we had this in many um, uh, presentations and mostly in Marcus and mine presentation is how to define a good life, what is the solidary mode of living, what are principles, what are demands, what are already experiences. Michael was insisting, if I got it right, how to organize learning processes. And, and um, the, pre the precondition is the will to change. And maybe these are two different, and it's not opposed, but two different um, perspectives, two different foci on radical change. Because um, if we consider from today on radical change, usually we, we, we start from the existing, of course, yeah, from the existing mobility system. We know that we need more public transport, et cetera, et cetera. But um, this, this focus on learning processes, I, I, I find this really interesting. And, and maybe we should focus this more in a, 
uh, within our debates and within the left. And the second is um, to avoid a misunderstanding, Nora, I think also degrowth means less throughput, less input, um, and also to, to, um, to reduce certain production, uh, 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 certain forms of production, automobiles, et cetera, et cetera. But I, what I found interesting, and this I wanted to underline when, when Michael was sharing his experience, that for a certain extent, we need this enormous resources to get our societies out of um, out the, this, this capitalist escalation and this capitalist growth dynamics. This was my point, and I find this to be considered because um, now we are finishing the book on um, the, the, for the degrowth conference in Vienna 2020 on strategies for social ecological transformation. And many contributions uh, kind of um, um, praise the smallest beautiful perspective. But given the enormous global problem, the enormous, uh, the sheer size of global problems, the smallest beautiful local perspective, I would say is too reduced. This was uh, this um, point I wanted to stress. Okay, thank you. Um, are there other comments? Well, I take that opportunity because I'm more, I'm not a sociologist, I'm more a technical person. Um, the problem, uh, what you just said about local and the enormous investments that were mentioned in a war economy, where the economy which is needed to convert this capitalist system into another system, means that it is not only saying we need uh, the money, but we have to know what to do with the money. And what to do is the money is um, not goodwill and solidarity, but is absolutely industry politics. So if we talk about converting capitalist industry, we must work on plans. Of course, you cannot work it out until the evolution. But what is the alternative in an industrial research environment? Uh, so the research and development program, what we want, in, uh, where we want to spend the money to go for other energy sources, other ways of transport, other ways of manufacturing. Um, there's very little discussion on that. There's something like, okay, we have to go for solar energy, but what does it mean, solar energy? It's a big chemical industry to make solar cells. I mean, the footprint discussion, where you can say everything is a footprint, but what is it? And I think it is extremely important to intertwine with this discussion the need for a socialist uh, future uh, industry politics. To think about the early period in the Russian Revolution when there was no, uh, was a coal shortage uh, because the Donbass was not reachable. And so they went to um, do wood and, uh, and uh, what is that again in German, the brown coal, uh, well, around uh, uh, Moscow. And, yeah, and, and then uh, it was a fantastic. Uh, Pollution and, and the whole Soviet Union is actually uh, one big uh, polluted era of the world. So um, it is not enough to say we go for a democratic and uh, clean, friendly solidarity. No, we have to make a very tough research and, and demands on what how do we develop uh, and and of there is a political problem that the analysis political uh, analysis is is split from the technology so we believe some technologies we believe in hydrogen so what, what does it mean what what, is, what has to be worked on that how to handle that and if we don't um, integrate it in this discussion um well maybe we get the, the money but we don't know what to do with it except to uh, make discussions. So I think, uh, I just want to bring up, I don't expect that anybody has an answer. Uh, I only have these questions that integrating the demands we discussed and the uh, enormous amount of money needed and possibly available for conversion, we need to know how to convert, what to convert, and with who to convert. And that is... is still a completely open discussion in the left and goes way beyond um, the discussion of clean energy because nobody actually knows what that means 
uh, uh, safe energy, uh, healthy energy, uh, whatever you have, um, did demands uh, a fundamental rethinking of R&D in a, well, solidary democratic society. Well, this is my contribution for this time. I think there are others maybe who want to say something. No? Well, okay, then everybody agrees with me. Um, in that case, I... We can understand you. Okay, your... well, um, let me try. Uh, well, I cannot... Uh, Nora has already wrapped up a lot. Uh, of course, it's been a very impressive... Uh, uh, report that she presented. So let me just say a few words. Uh, there may be some overlap with what she has to say, we had to say. Uh, the conference was about historicizing the imperial mode of uh, living. And uh, at the conference, we have interpreted this notion of historicizing in two ways. And uh, the first interpretation was uh, we focus on the reconstruction of uh, the history of uh, the imperial mode of living. And the second was, uh, we make the IMO history. Uh, the first part has been weakly represented in our conference. Uh, in fact, only my paper did this, uh, focus on this explicitly. And the second element has received much more attention and is of course more urgent. Uh, we have, on the one hand, uh, discussed uh, the current crisis of global capitalism and the transformation or crisis, this was a debate in itself, transformation or crisis of the IMO, including the possible scenarios or projections, that was another discussion, uh, of the coming period. Now, regarding the analysis of the crisis, uh, we have discussed uh, institutional and spatial temporal uh, fixes, and especially also the role of unequal exchanges, although we have not been very specific about how this, uh, these exchanges work. Regarding the scenarios uh, we discussed, uh, we have seen how experiences from the past can help us to think about an eco-socialist uh, transition. I found it very interesting to see uh, Michel Brie uh, try to use a historical case to enlighten uh, contemporary problems. And I think we could do more in that respect. But we also saw how difficult it will be to develop a global solution based on solidarity without introducing a new inequality uh, within the eco-socialist alternative, this selective green modernization that we mentioned. So uh, we have covered a lot of terrain, but uh, it is still, let's say, only an, an open, a, a, a small part of uh, what uh, can and should be done. And Nora, in fact, in her report already made, uh, I think about 50 suggestions for topics that uh, could, uh, would deserve um, more thought. But let me say a few things about uh, issues that uh, I think could be uh, further discussed. One is, and this is of course my self-interest, uh, history including uh, notions of well-being that we discussed, what, how did notions of well-being develop, or when did notions of well-being uh, come about that were not, uh, or not yet, uh, mainly defined in monetary terms, uh, but also more in general, what is the historical dynamic of uh, the development of IMOL so that we can also see where it's uh, weak spots are and where it's uh, in which uh, uh, gaps it entered and, and chances it got. The second topic uh, I think is well, we have already discussed these scenarios or projections. I think also that scenarios may be better uh, in this connection. Uh, but what we have not discussed, uh, the of course, many. Uh, technical problems and, and, and clarities, and Joost just has mentioned a few, but what we have not discussed 
almost not, is agents. How uh, do we convince people uh, to uh, be interested in this? It is true, of course, that, uh, as, as Michael has said, that uh, uh, people need a concrete alternative. And one of the main tasks that we would have, I think, is to develop con a concrete uh, appealing alternative, which also means that people uh, know that they will not just have to sacrifice things for nothing, but that there is a very attractive uh, other way of doing things. But we also need to think about agents. The problem is, of course, that never before maybe in history have the problems been so big on a world scale as they are now, but at the same time, the progressive forces are at a very weak uh, situation. The labor movements everywhere are, almost everywhere, are in crisis, a deep crisis. Um, trade union density, for instance, on global scale is now 6%. Um, so, and, and on the, of course, there's a lot of resistance going on in the world, uh, lots of uh, forms of action, social movements, and so on. But this does not articulate yet in organizational forms and in mere, more uh, permanent forms of uh, uh, organization. And the question would be, of course, how to develop a new strong movement, uh, which is also non-Eurocentric. Then the third question that came about is, of course, uh, what Krista mentioned, care work, reproductive work, social reproduction, which is a bit uh, a neglected aspect. But this belongs together with another topic, which I think is also uh, neglected, and that is the labor, the content of labor itself. Uh, we have um, talked about more uh, free time for people and so, uh, but here the work itself has been the black box. And, the, and we've got, of course talk, uh, talked also about uh, the in, uh, influence of digitization and so, but uh, the work itself has not been discussed and it is exactly also within the sphere of work that we uh, should... Uh, think about alternatives. It's not uh, something that we have to accept in, its, in the form in which it is currently existing. And combined with that, and this is the third element of this uh, work-related uh, uh, aspect, we talk a lot about the commodification of things and also the commodification of labor power. But increasingly, on a world scale, we see a deep commodification of labor power. According to uh, Paul Bayrock, uh, he passed away, but there was a very important uh, economist. Uh, in uh, Already in the 1990s, in the global South, in Africa, Asia, Latin America, there was 30 to 30, 40% of all the hours that you could reasonably expect people to work were not worked. So this is what he called over unemployment. Uh, this, and in the north, we see an increasing um, hidden uh, unemployment also. And we have all these bullshit jobs that uh, we talk about nowadays. And so, so what we see is also that a lot of the labor power that people have is not used. And, they can, and this uh, is not only fun for the people <laughs> whose labor power is not used, it is also uh, very distracting and impoverishing in very uh, many cases. So this whole complex of, uh, of uh, work-related aspects would, I think, deserve more attention. Then we had what has been called the elephant in the room, China, where we have very contrasting uh, opinions in the conference. Uh, I hope, don't have to repeat that here, but I think uh, that would be very interesting for many reasons to discuss uh, China as it is it an alternative, is it not an alternative, is it a threat, uh, what is the logic of the development in China, uh, and what can we expect from it uh, in the uh, near future. And finally, what uh, Ngai Ling mentioned, the fourth industrial revolution, I would call it the third, but okay, that's a matter of counting. Uh, so this cyborgization of life, uh, commodification of the self, digitization, and so on. I think that is a very important aspect, uh, which 
of course, um, has lots of impacts on uh, everyday life, but also on the way in which, for instance, uh, resistance can be organized or can be undermined. And uh, I think so that would be also be a crucial aspect. And if we think a bit more, we will certainly find more topics than the five that I just mentioned. But I think there's a lot to be done and we should start doing more uh, immediately. Thank you. Okay, sir. Thank you, Marcel. Um, it becomes a bit like, uh, what? Thank you, Mar Marcel. The, it begins a bit of a, uh, of a Beethoven symphony. Uh, so we have two da capos. Uh, uh, one is, uh, is Nora and, and Marx. So first, Nora, you wave your hand. And so please, uh, you can react again on the... Uh, on Marcel now. Okay, now uh, I want to react to you, to you actually, because I thought uh, your point about conversion is really, really central, and it's one of my hobby horses, and therefore I need to, uh, I, I want to, I need or not, don't need to, but I want to say three words, three sentences. I think precisely because we don't know how to convert production, this is where we need workers and the workforce because they are the ones who have the qualifications and the knowledge um, to think about how to transform, how to convert production. And I think the trade unions are a bit weak in, uh, to say it mildly, in uh, considering that and thinking about that, thinking about the shop floor workers as agents of change, and not just as victims who have to be given some kind of money if their coal mines are closed down. I fully agree with you, uh, Nora, and uh, we come close to another subject, but it's not part of the discussion, which is the whole idea of activity theory and the role of uh, activity theory in the development of polit politic, uh, political action. Uh, Marcus, please. Yeah, um, many thanks for the summary and for the condensation of our discussions to Nora and Marcel. I wonder um, how one could possibly take up one or the other aspect or to condense them in a certain new common project, be it a conference or be it a kind of collaborative research. So I wondered if we could um, put crisis experiences in the foreground. The question could be how um, did people in history in current times process or uh, deal with crisis, with disruptive events in an emancipatory manner? And what can we learn from this for the challenges with which we are confronted? So I could imagine that this would take up some of the points that have been mentioned now in the final discussion. The idea of conversion is quite important here. Yeah? because conversion initiatives have emerged in times of crisis. Yeah. These are attempts, these are attempts developed by workers to cope with a situation of existential crisis, for example. But also other forms of disruptive events could be um, problematized, could be, um, be part of our um, interest, of our, of our analysis in order to see what kind of possibilities are there to progressively deal with disruptive events and what the catastrophes with which we are increasingly confronted. So I could imagine that this would be a kind of project for a conference or some kind of collaborative research that would possibly even more condense the diverse aspects that we have mentioned so far and would serve to integrate them in a certain perspective that could be dealt with from various disciplines that we are here, that we collect here in our, in our group. Thank you. Um, the issue you mentioned actually is that um, at present, uh, the slogan, never let a good crisis um, go to waste, was always um, filled in by, by our adversaries. 
and it is now our turn to use this crisis for our purposes. But what is needed, and I think that is also what we are doing at this moment, is if you look at uh, if that the neoliberal uh, theory formation that was a process of many years uh, before it became popular. And that was a development of, um, well, uh, workshops, conferences, uh, to redefine uh, liberalism. And what we're actually doing now in this conference, and I think of the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation is one uh, big uh, uh, machine in that, is to have these conferences to formulate our answer to uh, the crisis, which this time we uh, must grab instead of leaving it to the capitalists. And that means, yes, indeed, um, uh, Marcus, a continuation of a series of conferences, maybe more specific, maybe smaller, maybe larger. I think in the coming period, we have to discuss among each other uh, what themes can what can we do, and, and many well. Uh, Nora mentioned a lot. Uh, we have also, I mentioned the technology discussion. How do we want to see conversion change be organized from the work floor, from the R&D? institutions, from the universities, and from the activists. And I think um, what we tried with this conference was a step, a second step, actually, uh, to get a better understanding on the actual situation, also in an historical perspective. And now we have to try to formulate, and that is the most difficult thing in life, that the future, because you cannot predict the future, but we can, you can work on it. So I think we can, in spite of the red distal time, but if there's still people who want to add something, we can close this session and uh, this conference with the, um, uh, yes, I see here from uh, Mika to everybody, it should be more than a series of conference. Yes, indeed. Um, so um, there is work to do which means uh, we take a five minutes break, uh, we stop this conference and then we start working again, uh, maybe a free Sunday, a bit Christian ID, but okay, on Monday morning then. And I hope that there will be internal discussions, email correspondence and so on with new proposals for setting up um, a variety of, of conferences and meetings, to maybe more specific to certain problems uh, with more, well, say, specialized people around. Uh, if we don't do it, um, uh, we uh, we will miss the boat, and uh, and and that is not our purpose. So um, I wish you a very nice afternoon, a pleasant Sunday, and please start thinking how to go on and. Another thing is that on the website, we will uh, uh, ultimately get the videos from this conference. And there is also a request uh, from the organizers. Um, if you have things in your PowerPoints, uh, other things which are fit for a presentation on the website, you can have a one-to-one -one correspondence on that. Please let us know what you have available and what is Publical for website and, and build up a kind of uh, repository which we can use in, in further discussions as well. Uh, so that's it for us. Uh, Marcel, you have? Uh, you, you, Marcel is happy, so I'm happy. Evan, happy, so everybody's happy here. And uh, uh, Uli, you want to say something? Yes, yeah. I would like to thank you, um, <laughs> everybody, that you um, spent about the two days maybe also the organizers who had a lot of work to do in advance, also the technical support and many thanks to all of you who presented, who thought about it and the participants. And um, I'm very happy that we recorded the sessions and that they are available. Yes, and also from my side and also from Marco's side, um, many, many thanks. Okay, then these are the final words. I will wish you a long life as they say in China. And, uh, and a healthy life as well. 
um, what is and called? a good life. And, and good, good life, life, yes. <laughs> and a solidarity <laughs> life. In a socialist future. That's for sure. Okay. 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 Thanks a lot. We close the meeting. Looking forward to meeting you again. Bye. Bye. Bye.